So we are live now. Welcome uh, everybody and uh, good morning to everybody worldwide. Uh, we are very happy to start our session on corporate strategy in a digital pandemized age, meaning in how far the pandemic is actually influencing us, influencing our lives, our business life, and in how far corporates have to change their strategies to survive through the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, let me give you 30 seconds, a uh, quick summary, where do we stand with the pandemic, since our my company is heavily involved at the moment as a key, one of the key companies developing and uh, producing uh, corona tests worldwide. And we see that the pandemic is coming back, particularly in Europe. Uh, we see it dramatically uh, in Spain and France. Uh, but even uh, in uh, in the eastern parts, uh, Germany is still holding up. But even in Germany, we are expecting that the peak of the second wave will be in December, with expected twenty thousand infections per day uh, here in Germany. Yeah, so uh, I think the pandemic will hit back heavily uh, in the last quarter and first quarter of next year. So. Uh, lockdowns can be expected again, as we see it now in Spain with Madrid today, uh, that they lock down Madrid, and I think uh, it will influence all of us. The very disturbing news of the week was that uh, in several regions of the world, particularly in Africa, the virus mutated so much uh, in the meantime that uh, we are afraid um, that the current vaccine uh, which are developed in Europe and in the States, um, which are basically developed on Caucasian people, will not address the new mutations uh, in Africa or in Southeast Asia, and therefore will not actually protect the world uh, for the virus in the future because of these tremendous mutations we see in other regions, you know, based on different gene structures, uh, uh, and so on. So I think uh, the pandemic will influence us beyond the year 2021. Uh, it will stay with us for at least some years. And uh, everybody has to be cautious in terms of traveling in the future. Testing will be, you know, a day-to-day -day job. And uh, I think we will all uh, live with the masks for a very long time. Yeah. Which again brings us to the topic, you know, of today. In how far do we have to adjust our life, our strategies, our corporate life to the pandemic? And that's why I'm so happy to have a panel here with such uh, distinguished guests and experts. And I want to start, ladies, first uh, with Sweden, you know, and uh, then we follow the way through that everybody can say basically who he is and uh, what is this view, you know, for the next two uh, years to come in terms of their strategy and how do you want to address the pandemic? Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Jana Niken. I'm uh, calling in from Malmö in the south of Sweden. I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, the CEO of uh, a company called Divine Robot which works with uh, software development uh, and especially with new technologies and immersive experiences such as virtual reality to create business value for our clients. Uh, example of cases that we've been working with are VR training for the armed forces, visualizations and onboarding tools for municipal wastewater treatment systems. I think um, as to the question for this panel, how will firms change their structures and strategies to compete and what uh, our outlook is for the coming years is that uh, I think something that we're all competing with in, in the, my line of industry is uh, competence and uh, the lack of specialized competence uh, is very, very, very hard in, uh, in Sweden. We have a small local uh, labor market and uh, companies have always been recruited from a been recruiting from abroad, which is now becoming obviously very much more difficult in terms of lockdowns, uh, visa requirements, people not wanting or being able to travel, um, and therefore competition 
for labor locally is increasing. However, I think that we should view this these lockdowns um, can, of course, be an opportunity in terms of borders opening virtually or, or digitally all over the world. So it will become easier to outsource your work if everybody is outsourcing. So we need to look uh, internationally and work more in distributed teams. Um, I think it's the way to go, actually. And people moving out into the countryside, seeing that they don't need to live in the city in order to commute to work, but you can work from anywhere because that's what people are doing already. So we need to address these issues of how to work uh, in distributed teams and not only trying to recreate the office online. So uh, not not to watch over, over staff uh, between nine to five. People may have different circumstances where they work more creatively in the evening. So to make use of uh, asynchronicity, I think, is um, is the key here in terms of building uh, successful teams. Now, I think you're muted here, Thomas. See, um, OK, Japan, how do you see the world of tomorrow? All right. Um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hidetoshi Uchiyama, uh, CEO of Uneri Japan. Uh, my, company, my company is, uh, just let me introduce myself, uh, my company is the largest location-based service platform in Japan. Uh, for example, we provide the IoT service for the vending machines uh, because Japan has more than 5 million vending machines, which is almost the same number in, in the U.S. So we have a lot of vending machines. So if you select the pop through your through your mobile phone, you can get a pop from the vending machine. Um, so regarding the COVID-19, uh, Japanese government decided to reduce the human transfer by 80%. That's a target. And we, the Tokyo has locked down, and uh, we can go abroad, of course. So uh, we have uh, more than 1 million users and uh, 50 billion location log. So we provide the congestion information of about 50,000 supermarkets in response to COVID-19. So recently, 50 million people look at our web page and uh, decide when and where, to, where they go for shopping. So in two or three years, so we have a lot of location log. So we like to analyze and implement our location data into a lot of web services, such as Google and Yahoo. And uh, we want to provide our data, data to a lot of corporate IT system to avoid the risk of COVID-19 and build a new normal state. That's what I'm thinking. OK. Thank you so much for, for your introduction. I could immediately ask you now five more questions, because I think it's exciting what, what you do also in, in Sweden with your platform. Uh, but we come to this later. Let's start with, uh, let's continue with Poland. Good morning, Poland. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Victor Schmidt. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, NetGuru. We, we have, um, uh, it's, it's a service business. We work with startups and work with corporates and we help them build the digital products. So we spend a lot of time with our clients building digital platforms. Um, and I think from this context, really very, very quickly, um, I definitely see um, kind of internally and externally with our clients um, something that's kind of pretty obvious. So the, 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 the changes in patterns of remote work. Um, uh, so that's something that we kind of spoke about uh, what, what Diana mentioned uh, also already. Uh, so we, we kind of, as, as, as our business, we've been very much open and, and kind of, I guess, ready in some ways for this crisis because we've been um, kind of remote first for, for a very long time. We had, uh, we still have offices, but um, we didn't really require anybody to, to come to those offices. So we've been very um, open to people working from home and, and a lot of people did do that. And obviously now this kind of uh, became one of the big uh, advantages and, and something that, uh, you know, pretty much most of the people uh, had to do uh, in, in, in the types of kind of industries that were uh, where it was possible, that we were lucky enough to, for it to be possible. So this is definitely one of the big things. And, and when we when we took, talk to folks uh, and kind of ask them how they see this, uh, also after you know hopefully everything kind of uh, 
comes back to normal or, or kind of semi-normal, uh, we see more than, um, so, so we, previously we had like 30% folks who worked primarily from the office, so, so still a very low number. Um, and now the number that they are kind of expecting to, to come back, they, they said there's a lot, a lot around 10% of, of folks uh, think they're going to be uh, working primarily from office. So I think this is an extreme, I, we have kind of an extreme situation here, but it gives you an idea of, you know, even for folks who are kind of happy to work from, from office, uh, the number goes down uh, substantially when they realize it's not really as um, as needed. And then I guess from the perspective kind of a little bit outside of our organization, we definitely see uh, our clients looking at digitization as something that kind of helps them, you know, in the very beginning of this crisis, I think, survive. But now uh, people are kind of thinking about this as a way to to, um, to thrive basically in, in this new environment. And also even, uh, again, when it's all hopefully it comes to an end, um, I think uh, people kind of expect that that we will get used to a lot of those, um, a lot of those digital ways of doing business and digital ways of, of uh, living, and they'll, uh, and they'll stay with us for, for much longer than, um, than this, this crisis. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think this is uh, also some very important aspects I want to ask later, also how the culture is changing and what implications this cultural change has for the general economy. So, good morning, Russia. How is Russia? Good morning. Um, uh, my, my name is Mikhail Trevish. I am the uh, founder and CEO of Universal Crowdsourcing Agency Omnigrade, and uh, we are creating the communities of uh, volunteer experts and supporters around different uh, promising companies, organizations, and projects. And also, we are finding uh, the most creative and unusual and outstanding solutions of the most complicated and important business issues of these companies with the help of intelligence, with the help of imagination, with the help of knowledge from these supporters and volunteer experts. And I think that uh, in the new era, the era of COVID and maybe post-COVID era, there are a lot of very complicated business issues. Uh, speaking about changes in the new world, I'd like to mention that, in my opinion, uh, first of all, um, it will be more important to more focus on risk management. It will be very different risk management after COVID because uh, uh, risk management will become not the business of risk managers, but the business of everyone. And I think that there will be a lot of new risks, maybe the risk of new pandemic. Maybe it will be not coronavirus pandemic, but pandemic um, uh, which will be uh, uh, linked with another virus or some other problems. And uh, But uh, all these risks will not be the reason to stop the business, to stop uh, different initiatives. And maybe it will be one of the reasons to launch new projects, because one of the most important tools to um, face the risk and to manage the risk is to diversify the activity of different companies. Uh, because uh, tomorrow your core business uh, might be blocked by pandemic, so you need to have maybe several businesses. Um, just for example, a few days ago, I read that uh, Thai Airways opened uh, a restaurant in Bangkok where the customers can eat uh, board meal. So they are now not air carrier, but also uh, they are in the restaurant business. It's a kind of diversification, and I think that we'll see a lot of examples where uh, a lot of companies will start to launch new businesses and or new directions of activity. Right, uh, and m maybe the last thing I'd like to mention that I think that more companies will become more transparent, uh, more more honest, more open to the public, uh, because one of the lessons we learned from the pandemic is that the results of uh, one of the results of uh, um, some severe um, uh, problems is that we don't receive. Uh, uh, important uh, clear information about this virus from the very beginning. And it is a good lesson to that if you want to 
uh, manage the risks, you need to be more open and inform the public about uh, all the chains of uh, threats, risks and dangers you, you're facing with. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the first introductory um, session. Um, and uh, let me ask you to the panel now the following question. Uh, actually, two questions, and maybe you can give them a short answer to these questions before we then come to the next one. What we see is uh, at the moment that culture is changing. As you all said, you know, um, people are getting more and more used to online conversations, working at home with home offices. And um, do you believe that this will be a sustainable change which will remain beyond 2022, uh, that uh, we are getting used to working basically from home. We see even the German government changing now their tax structure that, uh, you know, working from home even gives you tax incentives, you know, um, and you can deduct basically the room where you work as a workspace uh, from your uh, yearly taxes. Yeah, um, So even the government is incentivizing you know, the change, uh, and in how far, you know, our overall life and business life is changing culturally, or do you think once uh, the borders, let's say, are open again, uh, we will fall back in old habits, which then also has an influence, for example, on real estate markets. You know, we see at the moment office space is everywhere available because Uh, corporates starting to reduce actually their office space and calculating already in how many people can stay at home, how many people actually need to go to the office, which then also has direct impact on future real estate market, future construction market, and so on. So I would, would be interesting your view in how far this change is actually sustainable or is it just a change for the current moment? Let's start again with Sweden and we go all the way through. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a lasting change, although, of course, it may go up and down in terms of the waves of the current pandemic or future pandemics or crisis. But I definitely think that uh, people will never go back 100% to the way it was before. Um, and for instance, in Sweden, we have this system of communal laundry rooms. So in every block of houses, if you live in a flat, you don't have to have your own washing machine, but you go, you book uh, a slot in the communal laundry room and that's where you do your laundry. So I'm thinking in the future, maybe we'll see um, architects planning for housing where you have maybe a communal office or communal workspaces. If you're living in, in small quarters and you cannot afford, you know, a separate uh, office room, maybe there can be these kinds of solutions. Um, I'm also thinking about what have, we all know what happened in Detroit when the car manufacturers were closing down. So I think this could be a likely scenario um, in, in terms of, uh, of big cities where there's been a lot of office space. Um, who, who knows uh, what it will be converted to because people won't have the incentive to live in the big cities anymore anyway. So even if you convert it to residential houses, they may maybe... Um, too much, too much residential housing in the, in the cities. Yeah. Okay. What about in Japan? Do you think uh, Tokyo will be half empty soon? <laughs> It's already empty. <laughs> But uh, um, in my opinion, that uh, is, is it sustainable or not? My, my answer is. Um, Uh, partly yes, because in Japan we have two challenges we are facing with. The one is that uh, the average age of Japanese population is very high, meaning that they don't, they a lot of people cannot use this or something, such as their uh, video conference or, or something. So that's the one issue. The other issue is that. Is that uh, Our business sector is depending on the manufacturing business, meaning that a lot of workers need to go to the factories or the office. That's the manufacturers. So, uh, so my answer is that um, 
in the service sector, so corporation does, don't require workers to work at the office. So in the service sector, we don't have to go to the office, but in the manufacturing sector or in the special sectors, which the, in the average age is high, they still don't, it cannot be uh, sustainable, sustainable, I think. Hmm. Okay. What about in Poland? Well, as I said previously, I think there, there's, there is a, um, some kind of indication that a lot of, uh, some of the habits are going to change for, for a kind of long term. But uh, to be completely honest, I have this kind of a mixed uh, opinion about this. I think at the same time, and this is coming, you know, specifically from the Polish kind of perspective, because I, I know that uh, it's different in different countries. And I think this is kind of interesting where, where you look at this crisis in the very beginning with the first uh, maybe two or three months, it felt like everybody was in the same boat, so to say, like everybody was in the lockdown, you know, Japan, uh, Sweden, Russia, Poland, you know, everywhere where we where we um, had a conversation with folks at the time, everybody was in the lockdown, everybody was working from home, everybody was kind of a trying to, to figure out, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And I think now it all diverged in, in you know, especially, you know, US, Europe, uh, Asia as well, like a lot of different approaches and a lot of different outcomes from these approaches. And then uh, from that comes a lot of different experiences for, for people living in different places. So Poland is actually right now very much relaxed, uh, you know, people wear masks in in in, um, in shops in public places, but other than that, I, I you know, looking at the streets, just kind of looking at the at the city, it looks very normal, very normal, to be completely honest. And I, I know it's a completely different experience in in Japan, very different experience in New York, of all places, and um, and I think this is also gonna uh, be different in terms of like how it's all. Um, you know, kind of stays in the long term, depending on how the specific uh, geography handled this. And I'm not saying you know that we know now uh, what's going to happen because, like for Poland, I think this this uh, situation where we're quite relaxed can have a big impact uh, in the next couple of weeks or months. So I think we're going to see uh, uh, what's going to happen, uh, and it's very much going to depend on 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 some of the the local environments and how how the the local communities are going to be hit or were hit already by, by the crisis. So on one hand, I think it's going to change, but, but the, the uh, I guess the, uh, how much it's going to change is going to depend and, and going to vary a little bit uh, locally. Right. What about in Russia? I remember when we discussed this uh, last week in our preparation meeting, you were the one who really were looking forward to have face-to-face -face meetings again. Uh Yes, I, I think that in ideal world, say in the year 2024, uh, the world will be something in between of the year 2020 and say the year 2018. Uh, because, of course, there are a lot of advantages of online format of work. Uh, on the another um, hand, um, Homo sapiens are social animals, so we need to meet uh, each other from time to time. We need physical contacts with our employees or our colleagues, our business partners uh, and our relatives. Uh, so I think that maybe in the future world, uh, an employee of one company will spend one or two days in the office or in maybe in co-working or in maybe also it is possible to to meet uh, with your colleagues in restaurants. Uh, maybe it will be uh, Thai risk restaurants all over the world. Uh, and other days of the week you can spend at home. And this combination most likely will be the most efficient. Uh, so I, I don't think that it, uh, the today life will be sustainable, but it will be a mixture kind of combination of different formats of interaction with your business partners and your colleagues. Right. When I see in today's world, I mean, everybody is talking about the pandemic. Uh, we talk at the moment a little bit less about climate change and reaching our CO2 goals worldwide. Uh, however, I mean, one of the positive side effects is that we actually produce less CO2 through the pandemic because of less traveling and uh, and so on. Uh, looking forward, 
uh, and this would be interesting, you know, to, to view this also from a corporate strategy point of view. Um, we, we have a few effects of the pandemic. One is, on the one hand side, we produce less CO2, uh, which results in uh, that most of the airlines, most of the travel industry, hotel industry, real estate industry are suffering tremendously. Yeah, And the question is, will they actually recover uh, on the short term? Or will, you know, will the world will live with less traveling, you know, beyond 2020? Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, the big topic before the pandemic was also Industry 4.0. You know, as our colleague from Japan clearly indicated, you know, the manufacturing part. Uh, now we have a lot of cost uh, with workers in the factories because they need to be tested. It's a, a big effort for companies to keep the factories up and running and uh, will this speed up the digitalization of production yeah uh, the pandemic and my last comment and question is you know another result of the pandemic for example is that we have a tremendous worldwide food crisis yeah over uh, 500 million people uh, starving because of the pandemic uh, because production is down in agricultural sector and um, uh, whether it's in Europe and Africa, even in Asia, because of the pandemic. And uh, the question is then that new ways of, uh, for example, food production like vertical uh, farming and so on will uh, um, close this gap of uh, the current uh, crisis and that new technologies are moving now much faster into implementation in order to feed the world. So looking at transportation, hospitality, farming, real estate, you know, these are all industries highly impacted and also the manufacturing sector. How is your view uh, in, in terms of speed of change and impact of the pandemic? Let's start with Sweden again. Thank you. Well, that's a big question, or, or many, many questions, uh, maybe. Um, and uh, since I work with, for instance, virtual reality, obviously I see that there's uh, there's a big possibility and opportunity to utilize virtual reality instead of traveling, for instance, uh, for on-site training or support. We can do that through virtual reality rather than having to transport people to, to different locations. However, when it comes to food production, that's a bit uh, out, of, <laughs> out of my depth uh, since uh, still we haven't invented um, the techniques for producing food to be delivered by a virtual reality. <laughs> no, it is quite interesting, you know, just in the last two months, uh, four major supermarket chains in Germany started with vertical farming in the supermarket. Yeah, it's a big thing, yeah. Uh, for example, if you want to have spices and so on, and uh, and it's moving so fast now, and it was clearly said because of the pandemic, people want to have fresh food, yeah, and this vertical farming in the supermarket, it's a big thing in Germany, you know. How is it in, in Sweden? Do you have that already in your supermarkets? I haven't really uh, heard of that yet, no. Um, what about Japan? Do you already have vertical farming in your supermarkets? I don't think we have. Yeah, yeah. but on the other question, sorry that I came now to this, because I was quite fascinated when I was mm. shopping yesterday and saw all these farming uh, cabinets mm. in the supermarket. Yeah. Uh, specifically, the Japan is highly dependent on, uh, in, regarding the food, we are highly dependent on the import from foreign countries. So we don't produce food by ourselves. I think more than 80 or 90 percent of food are highly dependent on the import. So that's why we are not, that, yeah, so we don't think about the farm, farm or something. But coming back to my other question, sorry that I distracted you now with my food story. Uh, yeah. But how far will the pandemic, from your point of view, speed up the change 
also in terms of changing the overall environment under the conditions of climate change, uh, mm. digitalization, and so on. Um, so you mentioned the CO2 and the Industry 4.0 and the food crisis, right? So yeah. if I just want to comment regarding the Industry 4.0. Uh, we have different concepts in Japan we, that is called uh, connected industries. It's the, the Japanese version of Industry 4.0. Um, the, and recently, the new, uh, new prime minister, uh, the prime minister has been changed last week after the eight years of the, uh, the previous prime minister. And the new prime minister's um, initiative is to form the Ministry of Digital Transformation. That's what uh, the initiative of, of the new prime minister. The, as you know, Japan is far beyond, uh, far far behind in terms of the digitalization. So the connected industries, the concept is very important because the, uh, the, in the connected industries, the, the information between the companies should be connected to um, make the supply chain more efficient. If you, if you can do that, we don't have to um, move the trucks and the trains everywhere in Japan. So that's why we can reduce the amount of the trans transportation. Mm. That's what the new prime minister thing is thinking about. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we had yesterday similar discussions here with the German game. Very interesting. Mm. What about Poland? Yeah, I mean, coming back to, to your question, I think there, there's a lot of industries that are going to be impacted long term. Um, I think business travel specifically, um, definitely something that we can, uh, we see we can get away with not doing as much, uh, you know, including conferences like, like we see here. Um, and anyway, obviously you can debate the, the, the efficiency, but I think, you know, even if, if we feel like the online thing is going to be 80% as good, it means that we can, you know, cut it down by by a substantial uh, number. If we can just, um, you know, instead of meeting every month, we can maybe meet every every three every three months at a quarter or, or so. So I think business travel is definitely going going down. Uh, I don't see, and and again, kind of coming from maybe my observations here locally, but also you know, I guess my uh, my personal. Um, Felix about it. I don't see travel and, 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 and hospitality in terms of like just uh, tourism uh, not picking up again. I think this is this is just something that people um, crave and need. And uh, maybe there's going to be a little bit of changes in terms of the patterns. Maybe we're going to fly uh, closer. But even that, I don't. I don't think this is going to um, be a kind of a long-term change. I think we're going to see, you know, we're obviously seeing a dip, dip right now, but but it's it's going to come back to, to what we had before, uh, eventually. Um, but definitely business travel. Definitely, um, we see this in this, again in Poland in hospitality, uh, in this kind of a small bubble right now without much possibility of travel internationally. But um, what we've been seeing. Is that the, the kind of business hotels, so you know, city hotels struggle and are continuing to struggle. But um, and, um, you know, our our seaside and, and our mountains were swamped, you know, throughout the summer. Um, so people kind of uh, they, they definitely want to do uh, what they've been doing before, um, which is travel and enjoy themselves. Uh, so. I but, think that we, we see it from, from kind of two perspectives. One is kind of more of a business one when I think there's going to be a lot of changes and the other one's kind of more personal one when, when I personally definitely see folks just basically coming back to what they've been used to in the past because they just want to and they, 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 they obviously care and are afraid a little bit, but, um, but they still, you know, crave the human connection, the, just the enjoying them themselves and, and spending time how they, how they've been spending time in the past. Yeah. Can I ask one question to the traveling? Because this is quite an interesting phenomenon here in, in Germany. Um, over the years, actually, the Germans uh, planned the vacation more and more actually in Germany. You know, of course, the Germans still travel abroad, but the percentage of people who traveled within Germany, even pre corona times, was getting higher and higher, staying at home yeah, and exploring uh, the home country. 
Now with uh, with the pandemic, uh, you know, as I can confirm, all the beaches, all the mountains were packed, yeah, with with uh, tourists inside of Germany, and even it was that it was a very fascinating uh, phenomenon, uh, uh, caravan sales, like camping sales, yeah, were up seventy percent. You have at the moment waiting times seven months to get a, a camping mobile. Uh, home, yeah, and uh, the same phenomenon we have in the states. You know, my um, my friends in the states wanted to buy it in the states. They call it RV. Seven months waiting time to get an RV. Yeah, so I think there is also a certain change that people want to explore their home country, but that you know people hardly can imagine to let's say fly to Kenya to to enjoy the beach there. Uh, these exotic places might suffer in the future also because people explore their home country and feel more safe possibly. Do you think that is in Poland the same way? So so I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to say exactly, but when I think about it from the very, very high level, um, and it, it con concerns not only travel, but I think a lot of the activities that, that, that I see that we do as, as you know, human species, It feels to me that um, the things that we felt that we have to do, so like for example, business travel, meeting for for business, doing you know the things that are kind of a we are required to do by by um, you know by employer or by by you know by things that that were kind of outside of our um, control, we gotta do less. So that are kind of a, you know somehow related to this crisis. So we're gonna do less of the things that we were we were required to do. But I don't think we're gonna uh, do less of the things that we wanted to do. Like the things that we wanted to do, we still want them, and we're still gonna do it. So that's you know travel, that's meeting your friends, then that's all the social stuff we we want it, and we're gonna do it anyway. That's kind of a, that's how I think about it. But the things that we are required to do by our employer, by by the by maybe some kind of a custom in the in the past that we thought oh we need to do this for some reason, we we're thinking right now well we have a good excuse not to do it. So how about we not do it because we don't want it? So that's how I guess the, how I think about this crisis maybe going forward as well as like we're going to end up doing um, the things that we want more and we're going to do a little bit less of those things that we, we don't want but we kind of have to do. Right. What about in Russia? You prefer to do vacation in Sochi or you would prefer to do your vacation in Italy? Uh, well, at, at the moment, it is not uh, possible to go to Italy illegally, unfortunately. Uh, but, but you know, it's a little bit funny thing. Uh, between April and August, all international uh, it was banned for all international flights. And starting from August, the Russian government al uh, allowed flights to three countries. Uh, United Kingdom, Turkey and Tanzania. So it's a little bit strange list of countries, I, and I can't explain why these three countries. But a lot of Russian people, uh, they, which, uh, who have never uh, heard about Tanzania, started to plan uh, their uh, vacations in Tanzania. And you mentioned uh, in, in your uh, in your question, Kenya, beaches of Kenya. I think that perhaps today it is more safe to go to beaches of Kenya than beaches of Spain. So it is possible that in travel industry, uh, it will be new chance for long um, uh, term uh, and long distance uh, journeys. It will be more long distance journeys in next couple of years or next five years than it was uh, yesterday. Uh, and I also like to, to point out that in my opinion, there are no Uh, uh, unsolved problems in principle. Uh, there are no unsolved uh, scientific problems. There are no uns uh, problems in business, which are also totally unsolved. So it is possible to find the solution in any industry or in any, any area. Uh, if today we don't know how to continue our activity in this or that industry, in this or that market, it will be possible to find the solution tomorrow or maybe next uh, couple of years. Sometimes it can take many years, but uh, there are no uh, uh, unsolved uh, problems in principle. So just for instance, once again, we can take a good example in uh, travel industry. Today, a lot of travel agencies uh, 
started to launch projects in virtual tourism. It mm -hmm. might be one of the solutions. So no uh, industry is facing now with any fatal problem. So all problems will be solved. Some problems will be solved next week. Some problems will be solved after two, three or five years. Um, in agricultural industry, in travel industry, in uh, um, transport industry and so on. Right. Sometimes you just need very unusual solutions. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally agree. But in terms of digitalization in Russia, I mean, you you have also a highly developed uh, IT industry and so on. Uh, is this also a, a chance for Russia to more internationalize in terms of offering your services abroad? Yeah, I mean, in the past, you... Uh, your overhaul industry structure was based on exporting, let's say, natural goods like gas, oil, and so on. And you had a few industries which were developing, like Kaspersky, with, with the software and so on. Do you think uh, this is also a chance for Russia with its capabilities in the IT segment uh, to have a more export-based industry in the future, this pandemic? Well, I don't think that it will be the result of this pandemic. Uh, it's true that uh, in Russia we have not so diversified economy as we need to have. But I think that the role of gas and the role of oil in the future will be less important uh, than it, it was yesterday and uh, than it is today. And in long term it is very good for Russian economy because it will help to Uh, develop new industries, new innovative industries. And if you take, for instance, um, our company, we are a service provider and we provide service, our services mostly to foreign companies. At the moment, we have only one Russian customer. So we have customers in Georgia, we have customers in Latvia, we have customers in the United Kingdom, we have prospects in Malaysia, in Emirates, in other countries. Uh, so, uh, and... Uh, It, it, it is one of the trends, more and more Russian entrepreneurs are trying to enter the foreign market. But I don't think that is the result of pandemic. It is the result of some more long-term uh, changes and trends. Okay. But the pandemic at the end helps, you know, to, to, to get everybody on the digital way. Okay. Our time, unfortunately, is almost up. We have uh, one minute basically left. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your insights and for your uh, great comments on, on, on our views on how the pandemic is influencing our lives, our business lives and strategies. I think it was very interesting also to see geographically the different views, how Japan is handling it, Sweden, Poland, and, and Russia, and I think it gives us a, a good insight also how global economy um, will be influenced and, and changed. Um, I think the key message is, you know, yes, the pandemic will uh, um, speed up the process of digitalization. It will have an impact on our culture, on our lives. Uh, it will have significant impact on certain industries. Uh, whether it's a travel industry, hospitality industry, uh, and also the digitalization in terms of uh, Industry 4.0, or, as you said, connected industry uh, in, in Japan. Governments are changing their attitudes, yeah, whether it's Germany, whether it's Japan, whether it's Russia, uh, in terms of supporting this change. And I think we will be in very interesting times uh, in the next two, three years, And uh, thank you so much for your contributions. And uh, all to you, stay safe, yeah? wear your masks, keep your social distance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.